Yeah, today. No. Okay. Yeah. So today I will be talking about uh, Xanadu's blueprint for scalable photonic fault tolerant quantum computer. So this is work that uh, did originate out of the MITEX program that I did during my PhD with Xanadu. Um, and now it's the, the basis for many of the ongoing research projects uh, at the company. Um, so the talk is based on a paper released in Quantum earlier this year. We have a variety of collaborators on this paper. Um, in particular, I will, I will thank Elon. This is normally a talk that the two of us give together. Uh, so a lot of the slides are, are, uh, are, are you know, group produced together. Okay, so yeah, as I mentioned, we have this residency program. Uh, we really encourage applications. Uh, deadline is December 15th. Um, I am one of the supervisors, so there's an opportunity to work with me if you like the content of the talk. All right, so I'll just begin with a broad introduction about all the different ingredients that go into the, the architecture. Then I'll actually go through the modules of the architecture. Um, I'll discuss the fault tolerance analysis of the architecture, and then I'll give a, uh, a highlight of one recent improvement and then the open problems that we're seeking to solve. So at a high level, the first question is, what do we actually want in quantum computer? All right, so for n qubits, we want universality, so the ability to affect an arbitrary unitary to arbitrary precision. We want fault tolerance. So despite having noisy physical components, we want the ability to suppress errors at the logical level. We want scalability. So to build this device, we don't want the resources to be exponential. And we want feasibility, meaning the resources required to build it are practical and economical. At Xanadu in particular, we're interested in quantum computing on a photonic platform. So there's a few reasons to, to like photonics. So first, there's a path to performing computation at room temperature. So right now, the architecture, as you'll see, does still require cryogenic components in one module. But uh, there, there's a path in the long term to, to even get rid of that. There's natural compatibility with communications technology. So uh, photonic qubits can move around in space. Uh, so that means you, know, you could, in the long term, link together photonic quantum computers over quantum networks. And this ability for uh, photonic qubits to move around also gives you flexibility in the choice of error correcting codes. So some error correcting codes, uh, if your qubits are stationary, have certain restrictions, like you can only have nearest neighbor interactions. But if you can move around uh, the qubits, you can move around what the neighbors are. All right, broadly, photonic architectures can be based on two different uh, architectures. You have so-called discrete variable photonic uh, encodings, where you're really using um, qubit attributes of photonic modes. So for example, a single photon's polarization or which spatial mode it's encoded in. Alternatively, you can use so-called continuous variable photonic encodings, where you have tailored states of the electromagnetic field that allow you to encode quantum information. So some examples are squeeze states of light or so-called bosonic qubits like GKP states or CAT states. So the architecture that I'll present in particular leverages squeeze states and GKP states. Okay, so let me tell you just a little bit about these squeeze states of light, which are the fundamental resource for, for the architecture. So for those who don't necessarily have a quantum optics background, electromagnetic field, you can uh, express in terms of two quadratures. Uh, these quadratures form a phase space analogous to a classical phase space for, for a point particle. A squeeze state of light is a state where one quadrature of the electromagnetic field has less than a vacuum variance, while the other has greater. Um, these squeeze states combined with linear optical transformations, as well as photon counting and quadrature measurements, are a resource for universal fault tolerant quantum computing. So you'll see that these squeeze states uh, really are the deterministic states that can be generated in the architecture, and then they can be used to produce uh, bosonic qubits, as well as just used on their own um, to, to perform gates and, and to construct the resource state needed uh, to perform quantum computation. All right, so let me just give you the other operations that come naturally to an optical setting that we're going to use to, to build the, the resource state to perform quantum computation. So uh, we have squeezers, which are actually the things that uh, squeeze vacuum states into squeeze states. Um, so a, a photonic mode is, is a harmonic oscillator, so the, the operator in, in uh, the Hilbert space can be expressed in terms of the raising and lowering operators of, of that harmonic oscillator on chip. So we would want the architecture to be something that can be built on chip since that allows for better scalability. Squeezers can be implemented with microwave resonators. The other linear optical components 
uh, are phase shifters and beam splitters. So that's what their operators look like in phase space. The phase shifters on chip are implemented with microheaters, and their function is to rotate modes in phase space. Uh, and beam splitters can be implemented on chip using uh, waveguides and, and you know, tailored structures of waveguides. Um, and their function is to interfere two modes. So for the encoding that I'll describe, these GKP qubits, these beam splitters are useful for generating entanglement between both qubits. Uh, the two measurements that we have at our disposal, we have homodyne detectors, which on chip are uh, implemented with photodiodes, and these uh, uh, implement the quadrature measurements. So if you want to measure the electron field quadratures, uh, you perform homodyne, and I'll show later, homodyne is used to perform uh, Pauli measurements on, on qubits. Okay. And the last measurement, which is very valuable, is the photon number resolving detector. So on chip, this is implemented with a transition edge sensor, and uh, at the moment, this is where you require uh, cryogenic components. So all the other components I described to you, they're all uh, so-called Gaussian operations. So the state in phase space is a Gaussian state, and these operations just change it to some other Gaussian state. Uh, photon number resolving detectors are, allow you to go outside of this Gaussian space. So they allow you, for example, generate negativity um, in the Wigner function of the state, um, and they allow you to, to generate more interesting states than just squeeze states. Uh, namely, they allow you to generate approximate GKP qubits. OK, I'll define what all these, these, these things are. I'm just foreshadowing what's to come. All right, so given those operations, I also need to provide an ingredient for how we, uh, a paradigm for how to perform quantum computing in, in a photonic setting. So in particular, measurement-based quantum computing is a good uh, paradigm for, for quantum computation with, with photonics. So you may be familiar with the gate model of, of quantum computation. So there, the idea is you, you prepare a set of several separable states, you apply you know, local and entangling gates, and then you apply readout measurements. Okay, and so the, the, the state just evolves through the gates until, until measurement. This model is suitable for understanding stationary qubits, where I really can think of one qubit that's continuously evolving. Um, such as, you know, that's superconducting qubits, trapped ion qubits. Uh, the one way or measurement based model, the idea there is that you first initialize some entangled state. Okay, so you have qubits that are entangled together. Uh, then, by applying adaptive local measurements, uh, you can both apply gates and get the readout at the same time. So the idea there is that you, know, you measure the first qubit, this changes the state of the next qubit, so that applies some gate to the next qubit. You, know, you apply some measurement that's conditional on the first one to that one, and that's how the, the, the qubit propagates forward in, in the computation. Okay? So this model is better suited to photonics, where when you measure a photonic mode, you really destroy the mode and consume it. So you can't really think of one mode constantly evolving under all the gates and measurements. You have to think about um, teleporting the, the state of the computation to the next uh, set of states in, in, the, in the entangled state. So in particular, to perform um, measure-based quantum computing, there's a class of states known as cluster states that are um, valuable for, for performing uh, logical computation. So these states you can prepare by taking a bunch of plus qubit states, entangling them together with control Z gates. So you can write that down as a graph where, where the plus states are nodes and the, the entangling gates are, are edges. Um, so as you, as you measure elements of this cluster state, you're propagating forward the state in the cluster. So it's, it's sort of a teleportation and a gate application. Uh, for universality, you need at least a two-dimensional cluster state to be able to do universal quantum computation, as well as some non-Clifford operation. So that could be uh, a, a magic state, so uh, some state that's not a Pauli eigenstate, or some non-Pauli measurement. For fault tolerance, you need an extra layer of redundancy. So you need a 3D cluster state. Okay. An important point to note is that you don't actually need all this cluster state at one moment in time. Uh, so some nodes of the cluster can be measured while others are still being generated. So if your, measure, so, so if your measurement's happening down at this end, you can still be creating a cluster at the other end. Okay. So for the 3D cluster state, uh, which I'll show in the, uh, in the next slide, you can be creating sheets of, of that 3D cluster state um, at different time intervals while, while measuring other sheets. Okay. All right. So the cluster state that uh, we use in this architectural proposal is the so-called RHG lattice. So it's um, a 3D cluster state, so it's suitable for uh, measurement-based fault tolerant quantum computation. It's advantageous in some ways for the encoding that I'll describe shortly because um, only Clifford operations are required to construct the lattice. 
uh, only paladin measurements are required to perform error correction. And for those who are familiar with this, um, the, the surface code, which is you know, typically just described in terms of a, a 2D layer of qubits, this is, can be viewed as the foliated or the measurement-based version of the surface code. So for, again, for those who are familiar, many of the error correction properties of the surface code um, get inherited by this cluster state. For those who aren't familiar, just take it as this is the state we're trying to uh, create. Um, and I'll now describe what the actual qubits are in this cluster state. So right now, everything's been abstract at the level of, OK, there's some plus state that I want to generate, some CZ gate I want to uh, apply to entangle them. But how are we actually going to encode a qubit into a photonic mode? So we're interested in so-called GKP states as, as our qubits. So in their ideal form, these GKP states are superpositions of eigenstates of the electromagnetic field quadrature. So the zero state corresponds to, to even integer multiples of root pi. The one state corresponds to odd integer multiples. So these are uh, orthogonal states, right? They're, they don't have the same support in, in phase space. Um, and so that allows you to define a two-dimensional subspace. So that's a qubit. Um, this spacing in phase space is also valuable because it allows you to tolerate a certain amount of error that arises in the CV space. So uh, you can notice that if you, if you shift the zero state, but it stays shifted within one of these blue bins, you can always correct, you, you can always move it back to the, the, the correct um, value of, of root pi because it hasn't drifted into the red bin yet and you wouldn't mistake it for a one state. So the spacing between the states allows you to, to correct displacement errors at the CV level. Um, the caveat being that displacements can't be larger than root pi over two, okay? Larger displacements, you'd end up just rounding it to the wrong integer multiple, but that's a qubit level error. It's no longer a CV level error. You, you've changed the CV level error into some Pauli error on the qubits. You've changed a zero to a one, or for example, plus state to a minus state. Okay, you may have already guessed that these states in their ideal form are unphysical because I can see the quadrature are unphysical. So in practice, uh, you need to consider finite energy GKP states, where instead of eigenstates of quadrature, you just have squeeze states of that quadrature in a superposition. Okay, so this is what the finite energy GKP state is. So this finite energy effect basically broadens the, the peaks of the state. And this is sort of a, the first type of error that we need to consider in our architecture. So there's uh, fundamentally, you're never able to create these ideal states. So these, uh, the error that you always have with you is the broadness of these peaks. Okay, in addition to these error correction properties, there's some reasons to like uh, GKP states, which is what the gates correspond to. So um, I'll focus on these columns first. So the Clifford gates, which are a wide class of gates, which include entangling gates, these can all be applied with so-called Gaussian measurements, or sorry, Gaussian operations, which you can decompose into beam splitters and, and squeezers. Okay, so these are operations that we have access to in Optic. So uh, that means that you get, um, deterministic Clifford operations. So namely, you get the deterministic entangling gate. So for example, the dual rail architecture, where you encode a single photon in one of two modes to define your qubits, in that case, you don't have deterministic entangling gates. So this GKP uh, encoding allows for deterministic entangling gates. Uh, the other class of operations that come uh, you know, naturally experimentally are Pauli measurements. So Pauli measurements correspond to measuring uh, the quadratures. So determining, you know, where did your state land, in, you know, in a zero bin or, or in a one bin. Um, quadrature measurements, I mentioned earlier, those can perform with homodyne measurements. So again, those are deterministic. Okay, so then the uh, more difficult parts of using these states are their preparation and application of non clipper gates. So to prepare these states, these are non guessing states, they're superpositions of squeeze states. You need some non guessing element, and that's where the photon number resolving detectors come in. Okay. So uh, I'll describe the, the proposal for how to prepare these states shortly, but if, to, to foreshadow that, um, use a so-called Gaussian boson sampling device, where you take a bunch of squeeze states, you apply a linear optical interferometer to get a multi-mode squeeze state, and then you measure all but one of the modes with photon number resolving detectors. And you probabilistically, so it's not deterministic, you get some non-Gaussian state uh, in the output. Uh, Non-Clifford gates, so for example, a P gate, so to complete the universal set of gates, um, you need not a plus GKP state, you need a magic GKP state. Um, but that type of state can also be produced with, with that device. Okay. The last reason I like these GKP states is how they interface with so-called CV cluster states. So CV cluster states consist of 
uh, squeeze vacuum states entangled together by a CV controlled phase gate, which just has that form. So these CV cluster states, these can be generated deterministically and scalably using squeezers and beam splitters. So there's been some experiments already that show uh, you know, CV cluster states generated to a million modes. Uh, the beauty is that the entangling operation that you use to stitch together these CV cluster states is the same entangling gate to stitch together two GKP states. That also means you can stitch together a GKP state and a squeeze state in a CV cluster. Okay, so the idea is you can get a, a hybrid cluster state that consists of GKP states and squeeze states. That means the GKP state can teleport through this hybrid cluster. Uh, the Clifford gates can be applied to the GKP state in that cluster just using adaptive homodyne measurements on the CV cluster. And by periodically placing GKP states in the cluster state, you can also perform non-Clifford gates if those GKP states are, say, magic states. Um, and you can also perform the GKP error correction, so uh, you know, correcting for these, these shifts that arise at the CV level. Okay. So the bottom line there is that CV cluster states can be used as a platform to perform measurement-based quantum computation with GKPs. All right, <laughs> so that was a lot of uh, ingredients that are going to go into uh, what we want to build. So now I'll go through the architecture that actually proposes modules for how to build such a resource state. So the resource state that we want to build is a so-called hybrid cluster state consisting of GKP and squeeze states. So here's that RHG lattice picture that I showed you earlier. The red nodes in this picture correspond to GKP qubits. These are produced probabilistically. Because they're produced probabilistically, they will fail to be produced some of the time. So that's where we use the fact that you can stitch uh, a squeeze state into the cluster instead. So remember, GKP and squeeze states can uh, entangle together using uh, the same operation that you'd use to entangle two GKP states or two squeeze states. So you get this cluster where some of the nodes are GKP, some of the nodes are P-squeeze states. Um, this cluster is generated in two spatial dimensions, one time dimension. So at the top, Layer, we, uh, we have the you know, three of the modules for the, the architecture. You have the state preparation factories that are um, probabilistically producing GKP states. You have a multiplexing network to boost the probability of those GKP states being generated. And then you have stitching modules to, to apply the entangling gates between these qubits. So you have some uh, entanglement in, in the time dimension going uh, in the Z direction, and then um, entanglement in, in two spatial dimensions. That cluster state as it's being produced is also being measured by the quantum processing unit, which is illustrated at the bottom here. That unit is applying homodyne measurements to, to uh, those are those correspond to the, the Pauli measurements applied to the cluster. Um, by adapting those homodyne measurements, changing which, which Pauli measurement you're applying, you can apply gates. I'll describe how that's how logical gates are performed on this cluster state shortly. Um, so you can apply gates by, by adapting the measurements. Uh, you can also perform error correction. So by collecting the measurement outcomes and then applying uh, an error correction procedure, um, you can correct for the errors that have uh, arisen in uh, the state. Um, OK. So the first module of the architecture is how to prepare these GKP states. So as I already mentioned, these are Gaussian boson sampling devices. So the proposal here is that you have a series of squeeze states that enter a uh, linear optical interferometer consisting of beam splitters and phase shifters. And then on all but one of the modes, you measure uh, photon number uh, with, with photon number resolving detectors. Um, and this will herald some non Gaussian state at the output in general. So by tuning the elements of, of the circuit, by tuning the squeezing, by tuning the photon number resolving detector, you can generate uh, to, to some approximation a finite energy GKP state at the output. OK, so it's a probabilistic scheme that it's heralded. You know the measurement pattern. And um, we've noticed a, prob a probability fidelity trade off. So uh, you know, the higher quality GKP state that you, you want, um, that would contain more photons. You require some uh, higher photon number pattern. Um, so there's, you have to find some balance of, of, of where there's a, a sweet spot in, in that space. Um, the typical numbers to produce uh, a approximate finite GKP state you could have uh, three to four modes detecting up to seven photons in, in any given mode. Depending on the, the fidelity, you could create with 0.1% you know, to 1% probability the target output state. Um, and you might have, say, 96% fidelity to 
a plus GKP state where you have 10 dB of squeezing um, in each peak of that, of that output state. Okay. So this, this is a you know, theoretical proposal. Um, so the, the, there's ongoing work to, to refine this and, and, and to produce um, you know, improved, improved schemes. Uh, I should also note that the resources to produce the plus state are comparable to the resources to produce a magic state. So it's not like to produce to, to, to implement non-Clifford gates via magic states, you're not going to have to create some drastically different state. It's just some different configuration of the GPS device. All right. So those are for being those are opening GKP states with some low probability. You can boost that probability via multiplexing. So you have some, you can have a tree of, of two by two switches that will shuttle a successful event to the output out of you know, a number of these GPS devices. The multiplexing network is also where if none of your devices uh, succeed, you can substitute in a squeeze state um, since that will uh, stitch into the cluster in exactly the same way. Okay, then for the stitching module, applying these entangling gates, the first step is to create one dimensional clusters in time. So in this case, again, you have these state preparation factories that are outputting GKP and squeeze states. You have uh, a module where yeah, you swap in a state, it goes around one loop in time, you apply a CZ gate uh, with the next um, state in time before swapping it out. This generates a 1D cluster in time. So the CZ gate, just so you see, is um, implemented via you know, beam splitters, phase shifters, and, and squeezers. Um, I'll get to the end. One of the areas of improvement is getting rid of this requirement. So we've been able to reduce this um, stitching operation to just static 50-50 beam splitters. Uh, but for completeness, I'm just going through what the original proposal was. Uh, in the second set of the stitching, you apply entangling gates in the spatial dimension. So once you have these 1D clusters in time coming out, you stitch them uh, in space to create sheets of this uh, 3D cluster state. Okay, so the final outcome are these 2D sheets stitched together in time into this uh, three-dimensional cluster. Uh, and the last module is this quantum processing unit. So um, that is a classical system. So the homodyne measurements there get sent to a classical compute system that calculates what quadrangles need to be based on the gates that a user would send to the device, um, and also based on the measurement outcomes of previous rounds. So the measurement outcomes of previous rounds can be used to perform uh, error correction. And then that uh, will tell you, uh, as well, that will also inform what the, the next set of operations needs to be. Um, so that classical compute system, depending on the decoding algorithm, will likely require substantial uh, classical compute um, performance. So because you need it to be quite fast, since you need to have some results in time for next layers of, of the cluster. All right. So that was many ingredients. <laughs> so just to summarize, physical qubits consist of GKP states and squeeze states. They're stitched together into a 3D cluster state using CV gates, so beam splitters, phase shifters, and squeezing. Um, the physical qubit gates are just implemented using the measurement based model using adaptive homodyne measurements. Logical gates, uh, I'll describe shortly, but these, con uh, these consist of changing what the measurements are that you're performing to this, uh, to this cluster and um, throwing on this cluster. Um, but the bottom line is that there's different layers of encoding here that help with protecting quantum information. So the GKP qubits, those help treat displacement errors that arise at the CV level. So that helps uh, already reduce the, the error at that stage. Um, larger displacement errors that arise, uh, these are treated using the outer code. So this lattice is a qubit error correction code. Um, and as long as the, the larger displacement errors correspond, so the larger displacement errors correspond to Pauli errors in this larger code. And if the taller, if the, the probability of those errors is low enough, that outer code can correct those errors. Okay. So that's the, uh, those are all the different elements of the architecture. The big question now is whether it is fault tolerant. Okay, so the architecture has several sources of physical errors. So there's the inherent finite energy error of these GKP states, which corresponds to some broadness of, of the peaks. There's the fact that modes are replaced with squeeze states, and there's also loss. So I'll mention that loss, its effect on these GKP states is to broaden the peaks and to bring them closer together. Uh, and for squeeze states, its effect is, is to broaden uh, the, the squeeze state. So 
the quantum error correcting code, this, this outer lattice, um, it will translate these physical errors into some logical level error rate. Okay. So we say that a threshold exists if as we increase the size of this lattice, the logical error rates decrease. Okay. So you think as you're increasing the lattice, the, rates, the error rates should just be going up. But if there's a threshold, as you increase the size of the lattice, the logical error rates go down. Okay. Uh, this is sort of a standard uh, metric for the quality of a quantum error correcting code. So the first question is, does a threshold even exist? You know, there are plenty of codes you can define it, but then uh, there's just no threshold for even for any level of error. The second question, if the threshold exists, where is it in our error space, right? So in particular, the, the two errors um, that, that uh, are in play here, you have the, the level of broadening of, of the peaks, uh, and you have the number of GKP states that have been swapped out for squeeze states. All right, so how do, what are the actual requirements for carrying out those fault tolerance simulations? First, you need a noise model that can capture <laughs> the, these, these two different effects. You need a scalable way to actually simulate how that noise affects thousands of qubits in the case of large cluster states. Okay, so that's also, you can't just have an arbitrary CV noise model and then apply that to thousands of qubits. You need to have some model that uh, you can also, this, uh, you can simulate what's going to happen with thousands of qubits. Uh, and you need some decoder that will take measurement outcomes at the, at the CV level and give you some logical error rate. Okay, so I'll describe what each of these elements are. Uh, for the error model, um, at the moment we consider a classical Gaussian random noise model. So there the idea is if you have an ideal GKP state, which just has you know, infinitely squeezed peaks, so lots of sharp delta functions in phase space, uh, you, can, you can capture the effect of uh, the broadening of these peaks due to finite energy and, and loss by uh, applying a, a Gaussian random noise to the, to the peaks, right? So that will take an infinitely squeezed peak and now broaden it. Okay. Now, there's still infinitely many peaks. There's, there's no envelope. But um, for those who are interested, I can, I can describe sort of the, the trick you can do to, to um, go from a, a state with an envelope to one of these states, um, which doesn't have an envelope. This noise model is very common. Uh, for, when, for the study of GKP states because it leads to tractable simulations. So tracking a Gaussian, tracking Gaussian random noise on thousands of modes is still feasible as opposed to just an arbitrary uh, CV noise model. And it turns out there's also a way to model the effect of replacing um, momentum squeeze states into the lattice using the same model. So you basically change what the type of, uh, what, what the Gaussian random noise is that you're introducing into the, into the state. All right, uh, the cluster state that, that we're considering in the architecture can be viewed as some concatenated code of some inner code and some outer code. So the inner code are the GKP cubes themselves. So as I mentioned, those things correct small displacement errors at the CV level. And larger displacements are translated into qubit level errors, so Pauli errors. The, the lattice uh, encodes a qubit code. So it's the measurement-based version of the surface code or the RHG code. Um, that, uh, that code is able to catch qubit level errors. Okay, uh, again, to within some probability. If you have qubit level errors everywhere, that code is gonna help. But if the GKPs catch the small errors and have some probability of larger errors, if that probability of larger errors is small enough, the outer code can catch those. Okay, uh, we chose a division of looking at the inner code and the outer code separately. So the, the first decoder takes you from CV outcomes to qubit outcomes. Okay, so we call that the inner decoder, the translator, or the binning function. Um, in principle, you could just have some general decoder that takes you from a CV outcome all the way to uh, a logical outcome. But uh, this two-step procedure of first going from qubit to binary, then you know, binary qubit outcomes to a logical outcome uh, worked pretty well. So the inner decoder, the procedure is as follows. First, you perform a GKP syndrome measurement, which consists of a p homodyne measurement on the nodes. Um, this reveals uh, some outcome in phase space, or, or in that quadrature, sorry, um, which tells you which bin your outcome has landed in and where you've landed in that bin. Uh, the recovery procedure is to just round that outcome to the nearest integer multiple of root pi, since those are the acceptable uh, outcomes were, were they to be ideal states. Right? So um, when you round to an integer multiple of root pi, now that the parity of that integer, if it's 
even, that tells you you have a, you know, a, a zero binary outcome. If it's one, sorry, if it's odd, then it's a, it's a one. Okay, so this allows you to translate from the continuous variable homodyne outcome to a binary outcome. The outer decoder takes all these binary outcomes and uh, performs the qubit uh, level error correction. Um, so this is a uh, relatively standard way to decode the RHG code, but I'll, I'll mention in the next slide some, some extra elements that we can use um, from GKP states to make this header decoder uh, work better. So if everything was working ideally, uh, the unit cubes in the cluster state should have, uh, this, should have um, a parity of one when you compare the measurement outcomes, the cube measurement outcomes on all the faces of the cube. Okay, so that the, you know, should get yeah, a, par a parity of one. If you don't have a parity of one, you know that an error has occurred on one of the qubits. Okay, so the dec decoding procedure is to check the parity of all these cubes. Um, for the cubes that have the wrong parity, uh, you can now find chains of qubit errors that connect them that uh, could have led to that change in parity. There are sort of standard graph algorithms that can run efficiently to find what the most likely chain of errors is that would have produced the parity that you see. Uh, and once you find the one that's likeliest, you then, along those chains, you flip all the qubit outcomes to get back the correct parity. And that's the process of performing error correction. That, I should mention, is entirely done in software. So the idea of this error correction procedure is you make measurements, you process those measurement outcomes, and then you, you correct them. And that gives you the corrected value. You don't actually need to be you know, keeping these qubits live and, and flipping them um, while, while they're still while they're still live. All right. So as I mentioned, there's some extra ingredients that using GKP qubits can give us for this qubit error correction. So uh, again, the, the the problem is that we have GKP states with some finite width, and we have squeeze states. There's two repercussions from those types of errors. Um, so the squeeze states in particular via the CZ gates introduce large displacements to their neighbors. Um, and those neighbors or those states already have some uh, displacements on them from the fact that they have finite amounts of squeezing. The solution is that we can tell the decoders about uh, what type of noise we expect. Okay? So we know where the P squeeze states are. We know when we had a GKP state or when we had a P squeeze state. So we can tell the decoder this node had a squeeze state, so its neighbors are likely to have higher errors. So uh, in the inner decoder, one way to do this is rather than just looking at one node at a time and binning uh, its value to the nearest integer multiple root pi, um, you can look at multiple nodes at a time and do some sort of higher level transformation on all of those homodyne outcomes to get uh, binary outcomes. In the outer decoder, in this process of finding chains of likely errors in the, in the cluster, uh, you can tell it about what types of states are along those chains, and that will affect your uh, expected probability uh, of, of that chain. So that can tell you basically how likely that path of errors is, given also not just the measurement outcomes you saw, but also given what states you know occupied those, those locations. Okay. So by providing this information to both of those decoders, you can get better thresholds and better error rates than if you didn't provide that information. OK, so all of this, I can present the, uh, with all this, I can present the thresholds. Um, so this is a typical threshold plot. On, on one side, you have the logical failure uh, rate. So that's the probability that your logical qubit um, had some error that you didn't correct. This is for one instance of the, the lattice. So for this is the case of the whole lattice being GKP states, no swap outs. Uh, so the error parameter that we're comparing against is the amount of squeezing in each peak of the GKP states. Uh, and you find that there's a threshold at around 10.5 dp for each of those peaks. And you can see there's a threshold because as you increase the code distance, eventually the higher distance codes have a lower error than the low distance code. Okay, so there's always this crossing point if there's some threshold. Um, as I mentioned, this is for the all GKP case. But we also have want to check if it works when we swap in squeeze states. So here is a probability of swapping in squeeze states. Here is the uh, level of squeezing in, in the peaks. And we can, we can find where the threshold lies. So everything below this line uh, is, is a suitable parameter. Um, so 
taking an extreme limiting case, if you had ideal GKP states and, and squeeze states, you could tolerate up to 25 of 25% of the lattice being swapped out. But of course, that's you know an unphysical point, but everything in between is in physical, some physical point. Uh, the point is that um, there is some tolerable uh, level of uh, GKP states that can be swapped out for squeeze states. All right, after all this, you still may be wondering where are the actual logical qubits, right? So there's some cluster state, each of them is made, it's made up of physical qubits, but how, are, how is logical computation actually being done? And so everything I've shown you here is for the device operating in so-called memory mode. So that's effectively just applying the identity operation and checking if there's uh, a logical level error. Uh, but to encode logical qubits and to apply logical gates, you need to somehow break the symmetry of uh, this cluster state. So the original proposal from Rausendorf and company was to use so-called uh, lattice defects to put some sort of hole in the lattice. So rather than um, always measuring in uh, the x basis, you measure in the z basis and you create some hole. Uh, and then, you know, these, uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't understand the original proposal too well, uh, but, but effectively you, you, you know, can, can move these holes around each other and that's how you apply gates. A more recent proposal, which is the one that the community seems to be more interested in since it has uh, lower overheads, is so-called lattice surgery, where you encode qubits in, in two dimensions in patches and three dimensions boxes. So basically you take uh, boxes of clusters, those correspond to your uh, logical qubits uh, based on their, their boundary conditions, basically whether it terminates on, on the face of a, of a cube or on, on sort of in the middle of a cube. Uh, and then by stitching these lattices together or by splitting them apart, you're, you're applying uh, logical gates. Okay, so how does that work? Um, first of all, just on a single box to apply uh, X and Z operations, that just uh, corresponds to chains of um, X and Z flips along different directions of the box. Uh, for multi-qubit gates, that's where you merge and split apart these lattices. So for example, if you have two, uh, two of these boxes, by changing the measurement on the qubits in between them, you can merge them into one box. Or uh, if, it, if, they're all, if they're already one box, by changing the measurement, you can split them into two different boxes. Okay, so that allows you to apply multi-qubit gates. Uh, and lastly, to perform uh, non-Clifford gates, so this is uh, all, the, all, all the Clifford gates. Um, for for, for non-Clifford gates, um, sorry, and I think also the uh, phase gate, you, you need some sort of extra resource state. So for example, for a T gate, you would use, um, you need a logical level magic state, which you can get by injecting a physical magic state into this cluster, growing it to a logical level magic state, uh, and then applying some sort of gate teleportation uh, on the other qubits that are other boxes. Right, so, so uh, yeah, effectively, that is the path for using these cluster states to perform logical level operations. Uh, so yeah, with that, I'll just describe one of the recent improvements to the architecture, and then I'll, I'll conclude with, with uh, a summary and open problems. So I mentioned earlier um, that all of the entangling gates, these CZ gates, require squeezing elements and switching. So if you remember in, in the, to construct the 1D cluster, you have to switch in and out uh, qubits quickly. Um, but that's, while that's a feasible thing to do, it's still challenging. So the solution uh, to get around that is if you prepare a slightly different state, so instead of preparing plus GKP states, you prepare squeeze versions of them. But the squeezing, you don't actually apply after you create it. You sort of just target creating that state with the GBS device instead of um, creating a plus state of GBS and then squeezing it. Uh, if you create these states, then your entangling operation reduces to a static 50-50 beam splitter. So basically a network of static 50-50 beam splitters will allow you to implement all the entangling gates to, to generate the cluster state. So that's presented in uh, a recent manuscript in the archive, and it was uh, more recently accepted into PRX Quantum. Uh, so the, the new aspects of this architecture are that on one hand, you have more modes to consider. So you have a so-called macronode structure. So for every one of those nodes in the RHG lattice, you actually now have four physical modes. So that seems like we've grown <laughs> what you need to do, but the thresholds are better and you have a higher uh, swap out tolerance. So basically for any given mode, 
uh, you don't need as much multiplexing to uh, produce to, to get a GKP state uh, in that mode. Okay. The other thing is that there's a more rigorous way to include loss in the threshold calculations. So as I mentioned, loss has this effect of broadening the peaks. And it turns out with these CZ dates, it's kind of hard to track how that evolves. Uh, but in this case, with the static 53 z splitters, it's a lot easier to just track how loss affects the, the states through the calculation. And the, the good news is that it's still under loss. You still have threshold. OK. So uh, I'll just maybe leave you with the, the summary uh, slide, the summary points. But the, the main open problems right now, as I mentioned, um, improving state preparation is, is always a big objective. How do we get to higher quality GKP states with higher probability? Um, adding more uh, realistic noise sources into the, the models and you know, having hardware inform what those type of uh, noise sources are um, is, is always uh, an ongoing effort. And of course, the RHG lattice and the choice of how to decode it was one choice. We don't expect it to be an optimal choice by any means. So exploring alternative error correcting codes and better ways to decode them is always uh, something that we're working on. So uh, yeah, with that, thank you. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, so I will stop recording. And then if people want to ask questions, please.